Thank you very much, and shalom to all of you. Last Thursday, I think we commemorated the liberation of Auschwitz. So I will take a few minutes just to speak about the uh, liberation and the not only Auschwitz, but also mention a few other places. When they say liberation, I think to me, bothers me. What did they liberate? There was nothing to liberate there, except for a few hundred or maybe 2,000 half-dead people. What they did do was they opened the gates of Auschwitz, of hell on this earth, so the other nations and other people would be able to see it. The people did not know. I mean, the Germans who lived there knew, but in America, the people didn't know. In Europe, they didn't know. In, in, in uh, England, maybe not. In other places, but the leaders did know. And they couldn't care less. And they couldn't care less. The Polish on the ground supplied them with everything that was going on in these camps. And one person made it to Washington and came before President Roosevelt. And Roosevelt listened, and he said, after the war, we'll bring them to justice. That was the answer. The question is, why didn't the three powers bomb the guest chambers? Why could they bomb anything and everything they know? But I don't have any answers. In Auschwitz, why do all of you know Auschwitz? But you don't know, how many of you know Helmino? Did you ever hear of Helmino? Nobody heard of Helmino. How many of you heard of uh, Treblinka? One or two, three. I'll go down the list. Helmino was the first that can they built. They murdered in Helmino 360,000 Jews. Only three survived. Treblinka, 750,000 Jews were murdered in Treblinka. 40 survived. Belzec. 600,000 Jews murdered, two survived. And in 1946, a year, almost a year after the war that they were liberated there, one of the survivors of these two, Hirschman, was riding in a car with five other survivors from different death camps. They were stopped, it was, I think, uh, uh, good, uh, Good Friday, one of the holidays. They were stopped on the road in Poland by people dressed like police. They ordered them out. They shot them dead, took off their clothing, and left them dead. They left them there naked and, and went away. They found out later these are Polish partisans who did the job. Sobibor, 250,000 were murdered. Only uh, 64 survived. Maidanek, 125,000. I think a few hundred there because of the also working camp there. Auschwitz, Birkenau. Auschwitz had two parts. Auschwitz, where they worked. German companies built factories there. The Jews worked, and the money was given to the SS. And Birkenau is where they murdered 1.2 1, 1 million people. The Nazis murdered 1.6 million children. Of the 1.6, 1.5 were Jewish children. And the world, nobody seemed to know. Nobody seemed to care. And now, what can I tell you? I could tell you a lot of things, but it's not going to help. You can't bring him back. After the war in Germany, after the war in Poland, was just as bad as during the war. 
And I'll mention some of these things later. And maybe later I'll answer questions more about this topic if you will ask questions. Now I would like to go over and tell you a little bit about my experience. I wrote a book, it's called Little Miracles. This picture is uh, 80 years old. I was six years old when this picture was taken in 1939. This book deals with the struggle of my family to survive during the war and after the war, after the Holocaust. The book does not talk about the ghettos or anything of that sort, different things. It talks about hundreds of thousands of people that were taken forcibly by Stalin to the most God-forsaken areas of the Soviet Union. It didn't take us there to protect us from the Nazis. It was for slave labor, much suffering, and death. It was by the grace of God that maybe 40 or so, 50% of the people came out alive. The story of my family is also the story of many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of families who were more or less in the same places. Soviet Union is huge. Siberia is bigger than the United States of America. I start this, my story with my little shtetl, little town where I was born. The name of was Krylov, Poland, by the Bog River. And I mentioned the Bog River now. You'll see later why. There were no streets, na street names in my town. And there were no numbers on the houses. Most of the people had nicknames pointing out their shortcomings or their vocation. They believed in devils, they believed in ghosts, they believed in all kinds of stupidity. I'll give you one example. If I'd come into my house and tell my grandma, grandma, a button fell off. I said, are you gonna wear the jacket while I'm sewing it? I said, yes. I had to chew a piece of cotton, a, 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 a little bit of cotton in my mouth. Not cotton, but the, 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 the uh, something, something chew in my mouth so they wouldn't sew up my brain. Does that make sense? Maybe to you, not to me, anyways. <laughs> if, you, if a child is lying there and you step over it, the kid is not gonna grow. They're very careful about all these silly, silly things. But what are you gonna do? This is what they all believed. They believed that the dead ones are running around all night long, and you had to be very careful. Poland, more serious things, Poland was always a country where you have a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. Always. And don't let anybody fool you. At the conference that they had in Jerusalem on Thursday, the Polish government did not show up. They have their own ceremony, they said. They didn't show up because the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Uh, uh, said that the Poles get their anti-Semitism from their mother's milk. Shamir said that. He should have added that the church, the Polish church was very anti-Semitic. You have today in Poland probably hundreds if not thousands of children that were Jewish, and they still don't know till today, and today they're great-grandmothers. They never return, the children. So they didn't show it. They had anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism peaked in 1939. There's a group of undecim, they call them. And there's sort of like the Ku Klux Klan. In 1939, I remember I was standing by the store with my great-grandpa next to my mother, grocery store, and a stoop, he was sitting, and I was standing, and they came around with signs in Polish written, don't buy by Jews. And they walked around and around and around. And they, sometimes they knifed Jews, especially in the evening, if it was a, a person that they saw that could do anything to them, and so on and so forth. The universities were loaded with anti-Semitism in Poland, loaded. 
But then something happened in the world. In August, on August 23rd, 1939, the world was shocked. Hitler and Stalin signed a non-aggression pact. Means they will not attack each other. Three days later, the 26th, Britain and Poland signed the Treaty of Alliance. September 1st, 1939, Hitler marched in to Poland and World War II began. When Hitler marched into Poland, the Russians marched from the other side and they split Poland. The Russians got themselves the Polish Ukraine Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and the Germans got the rest. And now the Bog River, which I mentioned before, became the border between Germany and the USSR. And I was uh, five blocks away from the river. So we knew more or less what the Germans are doing. So we crossed the river to the other side, which was, now it's Russia, before it was in Polish Ukraine, and we stayed by peasants. That my father was a, mer a, mer a grain mer merchant, and he was busy with them. We stayed in their barns. We knew we had to hide in the barns, and uh, we were shocked to see German tanks, column of tanks coming in the Ger and the Poles and the Ukrainians throw flowers at them, welcoming them. We saw that. We were standing, we were staying there and hiding for about two weeks. Then suddenly the Germans crossed the river and the Russians moved into to us. With the Russians, we felt more comfortable. We knew they're not killing anyone. And then suddenly after uh, uh, the Russians crossed the river further, back to my house, to our house. We went with them, stayed another week and a half to, or so. Then we, the Russians moved out and we moved with them, took whatever we could and we never returned to our homes ever, never. We wandered around from, from relative to relative and finally came to a city called Vladimir Valinsk. In, in, in Yiddish, they called it Ludmer. There were 25,000 Jews living in that city. We had a, a, my mother's first cousin and my mother's family when we went with them, we were a total of 12 people that went together. They stayed by that relative. And we stayed there for about a week, a week and a half, and somebody informed on us that we were from the other side of the river. And one night, about 2 o'clock or 1 or whatever it was, there was a knock on the door, soldiers, and police showed up, and they gave us 45 minutes to pack up everything we had. And my father tried to prove to him that he was born in this city. He's a citizen here. They didn't listen to anything. They put us on a truck and took us over to the train and shoved us into a cattle car. And I'll speak about the cattle cars in a minute. And we stayed there for three days, three or so days, Till they loaded everything up, they called, in the Russian called a shalon, it's a transport. God knows how many cattle cars there, maybe between 90 and 100 at least. It's, it was just unbelievable. They loaded up all these people, the cattle cars, the smell could kill you. They, they transported sheep or uh, what do you call it, uh, goats, horses, cows in these cattle cars, but they never washed them. And now they shoved us in there all the people there, children, everyone. You can imagine how it felt there. And after the cattle car can be divided like two levels, with planks they put in the middle, the lower one, the upper. The upper is better because in each corner there's a little window. Air comes in, so in the top there is, is better to be. And uh, there was a triangle by one of the doors. Each side there's a door. By one door was a triangle, and that was supposed to be the bathroom. That's it. And 
the car, the, after three days, they began moving. The thing was just unbelievable. Just picture, picture. There were no disposable diapers in those days. Remember that. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. The train, for the first two weeks, we can have two weeks, the train stopped only middle of the night, and they'd bring in a kettle of water, or they call it soup, hot water, with a few noodles chasing each other around there, and each person got a certain measurement of this water. And that was it. Then to close the door, they didn't lock it, there's a, a latch, but no lock. But if you are on the outside, you can open it, inside you can't. And this way we went for about two weeks, then they began stopping more often, not because they wanted to help us, because the Russians had just one rail line. And in order to allow others to pass, they had to move the train aside, and then the others moved. When the train stopped, people began jumping down from the, from the train to go to relieve themselves beneath the, the cars. Some people saved that water, and they had things with them from home, and they tried to cook something, soup or whatever. And as this went on, the locomotive blew the whistle. And as soon as he blew the whistle, he moved the train. Now picture these people under the cars trying to get out. The people that were cooking something, trying to say what they were cooking. And the train kept on moving, moving, moving. So they rushed to jump on the train. They threw away what they had already just to jump. And you heard cries and shouts from the people who couldn't make it from underneath, and this went on. And this went on, my dear people, six long weeks. Can you imagine not to wash your face or any part of your body for six weeks? It's amazing. Nobody talks about that. After six weeks traveling, we came to the end of the railroad line in Russia. It was in the Taiga, by the Arctic Circle. We got off. We were like in a crater. Thousands of people sitting in a huge, huge crater waiting for something to happen. And then they began assigning to shacks uh, or, or, or barracks or whatever they had. We saw somebody leaving a shack, and we asked permission, they allowed us, and we were wondering why these people moved out from there. We found out later why, I'll tell you. Day and night kept on changing quite often there. Rats the size of small cats were running around, not afraid of people, the people were afraid of them. The bread they gave us, we literally, I swear to you, literally had to soak in water before you can put your teeth through it. And it was horrible. Anything they gave us was full of bugs. People were dying left and right. The first one to die in our family was my little sister. So beautiful baby, black hair, blue eyes. My mother used to be stopped. People admired how beautiful the baby was. She was about three and a half years old. And there were doctors there of the people that were on the train. They came but there's no medicine, nothing at all. So they told us two reasons. She had malaria, some I picked up, and her insides turned upside down from the shaking of this train. She was the first to go. They had a problem now. If somebody died there, you were not allowed to bury it. In the evenings, you put out the dead people from the shacks or the, the whatever you were living in, and wagons moved around picking up the dead bodies and taking them over to some place where they dumped them to a, a, a big, huge thing. Then a tractor covered it, and that was the end of that. My grandpa, he was a very religious man, a short man, a very strong man. He said he's not doing that with the baby. He took my little sister in the bosom, covered her. He had a shovel because he, he worked as a bricklayer there. And he walked into the forest, deep into the forest. And only my mother and my father followed in order not to arouse suspicion. And he buried her. And it always bothered him. He couldn't dig. 
a, a deep grave because the ground was frozen. The sun was shining and the ground was frozen because sun, night and day kept on changing around. And he always said he left uh, cell in the hands of God. It made him feel better because the animals and all these things and so on and so forth. After that, about a few days after that, I went to see my father chopping down trees. And I was lying there and I fell asleep. When I woke up, I, I was sick, very sick. I ran home and the doctors came and they said they had three good things. I had malaria, kidney infection, and pneumonia. All three things. And there was nothing they could do. The only thing they could do, as I was saying before, they, they had these, the, what do they call these glasses? The, something like this. Hopping cups. These were little glasses. You put fire into it, then you put it on the back of the person. And every part of my body was covered. Every night, every night. When we ran out of food to give the doctors, my father learned how to do it, and he was doing it. I still keep these things as a souvenir. And this went on, and then suddenly new, news came that they will allow people with the children that are sick to leave to another, dead, another camp. So my father and my uncle went there and brought some nice gifts to the people, and they put us on the list. And from there, 1,200 Jewish people moved to a Siberia slave labor camp called Revda. And we were about six miles away from the city. We were in the middle of a forest where there was a factory making bricks. And now we were 11 people. They assigned to us a double room. And every man and every single woman had to go to work. Every child had to go to school. I couldn't, I couldn't walk for a year. I did not walk. I couldn't. They worked 12 hours a day. The food they gave us was potatoes. It was potatoes. So my father went to work with a few potatoes in his pocket. That was, that was it. And in the winter time, oh yes, if you were five minutes late to work the first time, you were forgiven. The set, after that, next time, a half a year jail. So my father and my uncle and the company worked together, 25 or 30 men. They made a deal with the authorities, not to mark him late, but they would blow a whistle whenever they need him to work, day or night. But they would avoid prison. So my father would go sometimes to work 2 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever, and work sometimes 14, 15 hours a day. And this went on almost for two years. And then they came around checking. They were informers in the camp. There was one man next to us, next door. They found some two or three golden watches. That meant that he was a very rich man, and they threw him in jail. So then they came to search us, but we already knew. My father had a golden watch. I didn't bring it. I have it. It was buried for 18 months in Siberia in the forest. Because if they would have found it, my father would have been in jail. Before the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah, they told us to chop wood. We lived in a forest. Listen to this. They chopped wood, and the chopped wood we had to keep in our room. We had 11 people in two rooms. They're not too big. Imagine how the room, the room looked with all the chopped wood in there. And there was a stove, of course. So if my father or my uncle would steal a piece of wood, bring it into the house, and I was in bed, I couldn't walk, and they used to put the wood in bed next to me in case they come searching, they wouldn't look in bed to look for the wood. It was difficult. In the summer, there wasn't too bad because the forest, we, able, we were able to pick uh, all kinds of berries, marshmallows, and so on and so forth. And in the beginning, it was also not too bad because my father's family sent us things, sent us food, and. and so we were a little bit better off than most of, of the others. 
This went on for quite a while. Oh, yes. Uh, every week, once a week, entertainment came into the barracks, and you had to participate. They sent the Russian, they played music and dance and everything else, and the commandant came around to see that everybody should participate and so on and so forth. Snow there, when it snowed, you didn't measure it in, in, in inches, but in feet. And school was not closed because of a snow day. Otherwise, the school would have been closed every day. So that was out of the question. And they just indoctrinate you. My sister has come back with all these uh, songs. In, in a dream, she kept on singing these songs and so on and so forth. My father had to go and they would read to you the news, the news. And they interpreted the news the way they wanted. And of course, we never knew what was going on. We never heard anything about our family. Never. Not till the end of the war we didn't hear anything. In Russia, I remember two great newspapers, the Pravda, which means the truth, and the Zvestia, which means the news. The problem was the news never printed the truth, and the truth never printed the news. So we did not know anything. Never knew anything of that sort. My father used to use it to roll cigarettes, made cigarettes with these from the newspaper. So I remember the names of the newspapers. It was just unbelievable. Unbelievable what went on there. Holidays were not observed. I remember only we got matzahs for, for Passover. We divided up to many other people so they could have just a Seder, what they call, and Hanukkah. Hanukkah, my grandpa and I observed. How did we observe it? We had potatoes. We used to cut a potato in two, make a little groove in it, put a little oil and a little cotton, and say the blessing over it. And every night, we added on another half a potato. So that was the Hanukkah. And I assure you, it was a white Hanukkah, always. No, no problem there. Finally, we stayed there till sometimes probably just August, because when Hitler invaded Russia in 1941, in, 19, in June, 19, June 1941, June 22, 1941, Hitler invaded Russia. When Hitler invaded Russia, the government in exile, the Polish government in exile in Poland, made a deal with Stalin. And he forgave us for our sins. And he allowed us out of the, the slave labor camps. So surely we were very happy, and we wanted to go to warm places. We wanted to go to a certain area there by Georgia, but the lines were already cut, and we decided to go to Central Asia. When people like us there, they talked about Central Asia, nobody had any idea what Central Asia was. It was a geographical location. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, you know what the word Stan means? Stan means country of. So when you say Uzbekistan, means the country of the Uzbeks. Kazakhstan means the country of the Kazakhs, and so on and so forth. So they allowed us, and we paid whatever, very little, and they a number of families got together, maybe 20 or 30. We decided to go to the warm land. We came there, making it short, to the warm land. It was so primitive that when I read the Bible, I feel at home. It's, it's just un, un, unbelievable. They would not allow us into the large cities. We came to Alma'ata. That's Kazakhstan, the capital at that time. Today is a different capital. It's almost next to China. If we would have known geography, it could have cost to China. We would have been better off. So we stayed three days on the, uh, there, and they shoved us on Kalkas, shipped us away. We were placed from place to place for about a week, just moving around there. We finally ended up in a place called Turkestan. Turkestan, we thought was the city when we came. That was it. It was only the station. Five miles later, you pass a desert, five miles, and then there's the city of Turkestan. 
as we came to the city of Turkestan, police came, threw everything on trucks, and didn't ask anything, and took us away for about an hour, right? And dumped us on an open field, supposed to be a kolkhoz, there was nothing there. The, the women, the children, everybody began crying and running after the truck. We ran for a kilometer, maybe, carrying whatever we had. Then he stopped. He took us back to the station. And then parents, my father, every, all the men ran to register for work, and we stayed there. And we rented what they called a kabitka, the, a little thing, a, a cabin made out of, made out of uh, mud. No windows, no nothing, just made out of mud. And at that time, the, the hunger kicked in. Hunger is worse than death. Death liberates you from everything. Hunger doesn't. I, all the others, we walked around half swollen. Face was always shiny because it was swollen. Drinking a lot of water, was sitting, used to sit on trees. Some of the trees there were covered by a sugar coating. So to chew, chew these, the, these, these leaves, spit them out and drink water, and drink water. Next door neighbor, with two children, one was my age, the other one was a little bit younger. His father was in the army. They didn't even know that he was alive. They were so hungry, they bit off the tips of their fingers from hunger. It was just unbelievable, unbelievable. Then they began issuing cards, 300 grams of bread for a person, 500 grams of bread for a worker. Now, 500 grams of bread is, an, is, is what? Is a, a pound of bread, a little bit more than a pound of bread. Or a slice of bread, 300 is, is fine. But in Russia, if you cannot steal, you cannot live. So the people that gave out the bread had to steal. So how would they steal? They used to pour water on the bread to make it heavier. So a piece of bread with water is not going to be a piece of bread, 300 gram. It's going to be much less because it's water. It, it, it's so whatever was left, they had to give out, let's say, 300 pounds or 500 pounds, whatever they took, and then they sold it on the, on the black market and so on and so forth. So it's very, very sad. So people dying in the streets, trying to crawl to what they call in Russia, Pomoina Yama. This is the garbage dumps where they had. Most of them never made it even to, to the. It, it was heartbreaking to see, but that. At that time, my father, my uncle, worked together. My father's job there was just like you read in the Haggadah for Passover. He used to make bricks. How did they make bricks? They dig a huge hole in the ground. They put in dirt, put in straw, put in uh, water. They go in, roll up their pens, and dance in that thing there till it turns into uh, mortar. And then they had a, a form from a, a piece of wood. You fill it in, you take water and sm smooth it there, pull it out, and this dries out on the sun. The sun was baking like crazy there. Unbelievable, 120, 130 degrees. Even the natives at certain times could not walk, and we all walked around barefoot. We had no shoes. The natives, they are pretty good. It's, it's, you would see, on a lighter note, now you would see the natives, donkeys, loaded up with stuff for the market. And on top of all that was sitting the babai, the husband. He was on top, and she was dragging that donkey to the market. And sometimes it was all sand, there was no road. Sometimes the donkey would turn over with everything. So he would come down, put back up, go to the market. And the market, he would help her to unload. Then he would go to the chaykhana, which means the tea house. And the tea house, he would sit there, but there was a professional storyteller who would tell stories. And she would try to sell whatever she had there. And in the evening, he would come back. He'd get take, put back what he didn't sell. He would go on top again, and they would go. If they would catch you, if somebody would try to steal something, 
They walked around the Uzbeks, they walked, the Kazakhs walked around with uh, rods, sticks, over their uh, hands this way, the stick. There was a, a grabber that they called in Yiddish, a chapa, a grabber. If you had a piece of bread to sell, if you didn't look, he grabbed that piece of bread out of your hand and threw himself into the sand, eating that bread, and they were standing with the sticks and hitting so hard. So once I saw his ears almost fell off. And he did not move. And he did not cry. He just kept on eating the bread without sand. We kids, many times they we made uh, slingshots. We went around killing birds and try to make a little fire to, to burn them and so and try to eat. Once we caught a big porcupine, we were very happy. So, wow, we have something to eat. And we killed the porcupine, and then we put it on a fire. And guess what happened? It disappeared totally. Porcupine, it's all nothing there. Just a tiny bit was left. It's all water. It's nothing. It's melted down. Then we used to go to the railroad station, try to steal things. Jeffrey, any of you saw how cotton grows? Ooh, boy, I have to hurry up to get there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and we used to steal the things that would make from, from the left, from the cut, you know, the cotton gin separated the, the seed from the cotton. From the, from the cotton, uh, from what was left, they made like cakes. They looked like cakes. These called oil cakes, usually used for fertilizer and, and so on. Now, this went on. They also went around at night uh, trying to, to find man. Any man they found, they took him off, sent him away to the front lines. Any man. Anyone went. went. And this went on for quite a while. When this, and, and I'm trying to finish off here because I got the signal. In 19, the, when the war was over, we still did not know about anything. But we decided we will escape from Russia illegally. Whatever we had, we sold off very fast. My father and uncle knew a man uh, I, uh, uh, that was a, a big shot. And he, we took one beautiful gift to him. And he gave us, he, ma he managed to arrange for us to get bread cards for one month. And one Rosh Hashanah, 1945, and Rosh Hashanah, Hebrew New Year, somebody came to tell us that there is a train carrying s six cars with ammunition to Poland. Maybe we can make a deal with it. My father and uncle ran, spoke to the guy. He said, yes, they paid him whatever they had. We went back, the entire family came, and it was good because in Rosh Hashanah, they did not watch the station. So people would be able to escape, no, easier to escape from there. We got on that train. And great miracles happened there. I'll just tell you one or two now. Uh, on one station, we, knew, we, we thought that the trip is going to take three, four weeks. We'll be there. The trip took seven long weeks almost died of hunger. And I was the guy who ended up bringing the bread once a week. So once we pulled into a station, we were on the side there, and we were sure we would stay two, three days there. And I said to the lieutenant, is it okay for me to go down and relieve myself? And the lieutenant said, yeah, sure, go ahead. I went down, and as, as I went down, I saw from afar a policeman. And as soon as I saw the policeman, I ran back up. And I said to the policeman, uh, I, I said to the lieutenant, I think a policeman, I don't know if he saw me. He said, don't worry. He closed the door, and he had these machine guns with around 72 bullets. And that policeman kept him coming closer to us and closer to us and closer. And we saw death before our eyes. But coming to that station, we had two locomotives that pulled the train. It was uphill. And one locomotive detached itself, and we didn't know where it went. And the policeman comes over, 
and there are tracks over here, and we are over here, and we are looking out through that little window we could see. And the soldiers were white like sheets. And he said, what is that boy doing in a military train? And he said, there's no boy in a military train. And back and forth arguing. Meanwhile, that locomotive that detached itself came back on the rail opposite us, where the policeman was standing. And the locomotive blew the, 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 the whistle three times. But the policeman was so excited, he didn't hear it. And the lieutenant either didn't hear it either, or didn't see it, or didn't want to tell him. And the locomotive ran out right out over, over him, cut off his hat, and we saw the hat rolling down. And as this happened, our train began moving. This was the first time. And the lieutenant turned to my father, and he said in Russian, anybody who says Russian here? Your God did this. None of us ate for about two, three days. That's just one of the miracles. Another miracle was I went to collect bread at another station, and I, my aunt always walked with me, but she didn't go into the store. I did. I looked Russian, like all the Russian kids, very blunt, and so on and so forth, spoke the language. I got the bread on the way back. She, she said, oh, let's go back. So I, got, I saw steps coming. So I said, I'll tell you what, you go straight, I'll go on the steps, I'll meet you there. Well, she went, I went up, looked a different way. I came back. She wasn't there, so now I had to make my way back to the train. Meanwhile, they moved the train to a different track. And I have to find out. And I'm not allowed to ask a policeman, I'm not allowed to do anything. And I was 12 years old. I ran beneath the, the, the railroad cars, so nobody would see me. And I ran, and the, and the soldiers were so scared that I, I'll go to the police or something like that. And then they went down to look for me. My father, my uncle went down. Suddenly, I noticed my uncle and the police in one of the soldiers, and I followed them. And I followed them. And my grandmother, she was fainting, and my mother was fainting there and everything else. And uh, I got onto the rail on the car, Within maybe two minutes after, the train took off. If I would have been two minutes late, I would not be here telling you the story. This went on until we came back to Poland. In Poland, when we came back, we saw the truth. We saw what happened. And it was just as dangerous. They killed Jews left and right. Yet to hide, you know, it, it, it was just terrible, through you, through Jews of the train, of the trains, the pogroms, all after the war, mind you. But anyway, from there we escaped illegally to Germany with a kibbutz. That's for another time, if you'll invite me, I'll continue the story. And we made it. Now, I'm, I tell me, I'm telling you this story, not to make you, I don't want you to feel sorry for me or anything of that sort. I'm telling you the story so you know people never give up hope. Always hope for a new dawn, a new day. You take strength from your experience and go on do what you dream to do. I thank you. First, thank you for, for, for sharing that. Um, I, I mean, our, our brains just can't wrap around everything you've experienced and, and it's amazing for you to be here and, and sharing with us. That said, at the end of kind of what you were saying, you talked about hope a little bit. I, I, I wonder if you'd share a little bit about faith and how your faith obviously was kind of shaped through that experience and, and kind of what, how that has not only helped inform the hope that you had, but also kind of having to process all of that, the role that your faith has played. Well, the faith played, we were, we were religious people. We did not give up hope, but we continued believing in what we believe. Uh, let, let's put it this way. We did not blame God. God didn't do it to us. The people did it to us. These Germans, they were, they were not human. I think they were devils in the shape of human beings. No human being can kill for pleasure. Animals don't kill for pleasure. Animals kill only 
when they're in danger or they're hungry or something, or their, their, their little offsprings are in danger. But these humans, they killed for pleasure. I didn't mention before when I was, I, I didn't get a chance, when I was in a DP camp, you know, with DP, Displaced Persons Camp in Germany. We were in Leipheim. And Leipheim was a Messerschmitt base. The Americans bombed out the, the, the planes, but we lived in the barracks. And I played soccer a lot with the other kids there. We were 3,000 Jews in that camp. And we knew that if something is soft on the ground, something must be buried there. One boy fell. We went over, we picked it up. It was a, a rag with four or five pieces of soap made out of Jews, written on it, pure Jewish pets. Now, who wants to wash himself with something like that? A human? No. How can you kill? A Russian soldier will never kill a child. He will give his piece of bread. My wife, may she rest in peace, was, I didn't want to say it here, but it was in, uh, in one of the camps where two people survived, right? I told you, my father-in-law was in that camp in 1941, and he managed to run away because that time was only in the beginning. So six months he was there, and he ran away with a friend. His name was Haller, Abraham Haller. And they went into the forest running, and the Germans let the dogs run after them. And he had a stick. He's a very strong man with a 6'2", 6'1", something like that. And when the dogs circled him, and one dog came, he had a stick, and he put it right into the mouth of the dog. Killed the dog, the other dogs ran away. That's how he saved himself. And then he went in, went, ran back home, took the family, and went into the forest. In the forest, my, my wife at that time was two years old. A Russian soldier that was there used to bring every time, got a piece of bread, he used to bring for the baby a piece of bread. It, they're not, I live with them. The Russian people are wonderful people. The government, they are the bad ones, not the people. And this is true with all the people in the world. It's the government. These governments, look, look what's going on. I don't want to go into politics, but... <laughs> uh, but anyways, yes, we were. Uh, matter of fact, in, the, in, in, in Siberia, we were able to buy a chicken. The farmers came around. We did not buy a chicken because we did not have anybody who could slaughter it the proper way. So in our house, we did not touch anything for 19 months. Just potatoes. We did not, uh, no chicken or anything of that. Well, so sometimes a, a little cheese. My mother with the uh, 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 wedding ring, she gave away for a, a, a few eggs or milk or something like that. Yes, it de definitely helped. But you see, many people make this mistake, they blame God. It's not God's fault. I serve God because He is God. I don't serve God because he's going to do good things for me. Because if you serve God, he should do good things for you, then you're not serving God, you're serving yourself. Thank you for coming. I'm curious what your insights are on, not, I mean, of course today, well, throughout the Jewish history, Jews have always been the scapegoats. And we're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism, particularly in Europe and even in America. What is, as a survivor, what is your advice to our generation on combating that anti-Semitism? Uh, oh boy, a tough question, huh? <laughs> I'll tell you something. I, I don't know if I should say these things here or not, but maybe, maybe uh, anti-Semitism is an old disease. It's 2,000 years old. They say, Mount Sinai. What did we receive in Mount Sinai? Sinai, Messina, Messinai, Basina. From the Mount Sinai came hatred. And that's true. They have this hatred. Why do they, the Germans said that we are inferior? Well, without us, they don't win so many Nobel Prizes. They themselves knew that we are not inferior. We are not claiming superiority. But we're definitely not inferior to anyone. One only has to look at Israel. Can we get one more round of applause for Dr. Mitchell?